Hello, and thank you for joining this final panel of the 2020 Zero Emission Bus Conference. Uh, I'm Eric Bigelow, CTE's Midwest Director. Uh, first, uh, thank you to our session sponsor, Messer, who will speak about scalable hydrogen fueling infrastructure. Uh, in this session, we will hear from four presenters and hear about their deployment experience and key lessons learned along the way. Please submit questions through the Q&A function during this, and we will have a discussion period uh, following the presentations. With that, I'd like to welcome Mike Ianelli with Messer, Vice President of Hydrogen Fueling. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you know, I would like to um, begin by uh, thanking CTE for what has turned out to be a really wonderful event. Um, you know, I hope we are all um, reflecting on uh, a lot of the great information that has been put out over the last couple of days. And I'm looking forward to this last session and thankful for the panelists uh, that are participating. Uh, I think we have some good um, content to share and move this, uh, this really journey into zero emission uh, transportation forward. So with that, what I'd like to touch on um, is really Messer a little bit and how we can help navigate to a scalable hydrogen infrastructure. I first wanna talk about uh, hydrogen fueling uh, and Messer's role in that. I suspect that many of you uh, aren't familiar with uh, who Messer is. Uh, we're, not, we're not a common name in the US. However, we've been around for a little over 100 years. Um, we are a uh, industrial gas, German industrial, privately owned gas company. Um, and technology is at our core. Uh, in hydrogen fueling in particular, we've evolved in the United States over the last 15 years. Um, we've spent time in the material handling space, really creating some of the first indoor fueling projects in the world in that area. In the automotive space, we've built some of uh, several stations in California uh, that were really the first true retail 700 bar fueling stations. And finally, in the transportation area, we've worked exclusively with uh, AC Transit over the last 10 years to develop their program at both Emeryville and Oakland. Next slide, please. I bring this up because this really speaks to experience. And I think what many of you are encountering, uh, forging into a new territory is not a straight path to success. And I really commend all of you that have been really on the leading edge of uh, trying and adopting new technologies because it is a very challenging path to get to a successful end. Next slide, please. The reason uh, that's important is I believe our experience in this space and across the industry of hydrogen fueling can really help you in understanding a pathway to scale with hydrogen. So what I wanna talk about specifically today is really three points. First, scaling hydrogen infrastructure investment. This, will, this is an investment plan from as little as five buses to 100 buses. Second, user experience. How does it really work in the field for your operators? And then finally, operational performance. Next slide, please. Infrastructure investment. Before we start there, I wanna take a step back and, and sort of tie this into the journey that Messer has been on with this technology and the redesign and focus of a platform that we've developed specifically for the transit space. Uh, roughly two years ago, uh, we, we looked across all that we had done and we, we really determined that where we potentially brought the most value from a technology and knowledge perspective was helping transit agencies bridge to this new frontier of hydrogen fueling. We redesigned around a platform of liquid hydrogen pumping. And we did that not with proprietary technology. And I think that's very important. 
The reason is, is we borrowed from industries that had millions of operational hours on pumping systems, cryogenic pumping systems that could be transferred into the hydrogen space. What we gained out of that is reliability of the system and cost control. Further, we focused on the space that the system would apply in the transit yard. I haven't spoken to a transit agency that thinks they have unlimited space in their facilities. We can have, we can fit this system to fuel over a hundred buses in a 40 by 40 footprint. Finally, we built in redundancy and expandability in the system. So if you shift your focus to the right side of the screen, this is a bit of a busy graph, but let me just try to explain. We've talked in a different contexts about this high bar of hydrogen fueling investment, but then it tapers off over time. This is exactly what this shows. So the investments are the red bars. Uh, and if you look, the scale for the red bars is on the right side of the screen. It's in millions of dollars. Uh, so, for example, the initial investment is somewhere around four and a half, four to four and a half million dollars. That system will carry you from a bus scale perspective to somewhere between 40 and 60 buses, depending on how the system is configured. At that point, a second investment is likely needed if you're going to continue to grow the, grow, grow the program uh, to you know, potentially as many as 100 buses in a, in a, in a yard. So uh, overall, you could be fueling a, a fleet of 100 plus buses with an investment, an infrastructure investment of around $6 million. Next slide, please. Let's shift and think about the user for a moment. So we actually have one of these systems deployed. We have it at AC Transit's Emeryville facility, and they operate uh, 30 hydrogen fueling buses. We have been able to uh, conduct a test of that system. We, we actually lined up 30 buses uh, that were close to empty on their, their fill, and we did a back-to-back -back test of fueling over a six and a half hour period. Our average fill time for buses were six and a half minutes. And, and the time between fills was really no more than five minutes. Just the time it took to move one bus out of the way and bring another bus to the filling uh, point. So I say this, uh, you know, what's really important here is how this either replicated or almost outperformed fueling performance of diesel. The other thing that's very important to note here is that we actually did this with just one fueling island. We have two fueling islands at this location, and had we been able to have more buses, we clearly could have done a 60 bus plus fleet through these two uh, fueling islands. Last thing I wanna point out is that the system does not require hydrogen pre-cooling. For those of you that have been experienced in this, uh, that's a challenge and it can, uh, it's touted as a benefit for high speed fueling. We're able to achieve high speed fueling without this pre-cooling step, which reduces cost and reduces complexity of the system. Next slide, please. Finally, let's turn to operational performance. I think when you reflect on, as operators, your bus fleet, the biggest concern is what happens if I don't have fuel when I need it? If you'll recall, I mentioned the heart of this system was based on a pumping design that's been deployed in other industries. High intense use system. Using that, we've been able to achieve over two and a half million 350 bar fuelings between the AC transit location and another location that we have this system deployed at with zero operational downtime. Phenomenal performance out of it. We've also been able to simplify the design and the reliability and reduce overall maintenance costs by 25%. So I hope, next slide please. <clears throat> I hope what I've been able to show in a brief moment is really a scalable path to hydrogen fueling that's reality today. 
I look forward to the rest of the presentations. If you'd like further information, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. I'll turn it back to Eric. Hey. Thank you, Mike. And um, can I turn my video back on? Great, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mike, and, and thanks for that overview um, uh, on hydrogen and, and your scalable system. It's great to see that. Um, uh, if you could, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so technology and innovation and change are coming at us all very quickly. To borrow a bit here from Thomas Friedman's book, Thank You for Being Late, we're in the midst of the fastest pace of technology change and the fastest pace of climate change that humanity has ever seen. A lot of the interest at this conference is driven by how we can use this incredible pace of technology change uh, to help offset the incredible pace of climate change. Um, next slide, please. So this is a set of pictures made famous by a Morgan Stanley report uh, on Tesla in, in 2011. Um, but importantly, the, in the span of 13 years, New York City changed over almost completely from horse-drawn carriages to gasoline-powered automobiles. So looking to today, uh, in, a, in a variety of situations, battery electric vehicles are already compelling. Um, what what will happen when batteries cost 35% less from today and other systems get cheaper and more reliable? Uh, we've also heard a lot about the solutions provided by hydrogen fuel cells. What happens when the hydrogen fuel and the fuel cell system uh, is half of the current cost or potentially even less than that in high volume? Um, next slide. The solution to the question then uh, on, on what to do today, given this pace of change, is grounded really in engineering analysis and data. Um, and I see this the way forward here uh, in Excel and, and MATLAB and Python. And future deployment planning at times can lead to more questions than answers. Uh, for instance, how, how many charges do you need to cover your fleet deployment and what is the expected future fleet size taking in uh, vehicle ability into account and as that evolves over time. Um, can a bus skip an on route charge session and still be okay? Uh, how much energy and, and what does that load profile present to the grid and how much will that energy cost? So at, at CT, uh, half of our staff has a science and engineering degrees and we're excited to dig in and find solutions for our clients and help answer these tough questions and more. In supporting our mission to advance the success and pace of zero emission vehicle adoption, we've enjoyed the opportunity to work with partners in the zero emission space to tackle these challenging problems, come up with options, and help select the best path forward. We're looking forward to continuing to work with our transit, school bus fleets, airports, universities, and industry partners to find ways to increase the number of zero emission vehicles on the road. Um, next slide, please. We'll now hear from four speakers with a variety of experiences to share from their deployments and lessons learned. I'd like to welcome Diana Kotler, Executive Director of Anaheim Transportation Network from Anaheim, California. Well, thank you, Eric. And I believe I started my video, um, but I just wanted to thank CTE for the opportunity to present our project and have this discussion um, with the uh, participants, as well as pr provide some additional information about exciting projects that are happening in Anaheim. So Anaheim Transportation Network is a public transit agency for um, Anaheim area. We primarily serve in the areas of Disneyland Resort. You all know about our sports teams, the Anaheim Angels and Ducks, and of course, many other destinations that millions of people come to visit every single year. 
Since we've started in 2002, we've always been on a trajectory for electric transportation, and I feel like we're returning to our roots. We started with electric buses in 2002, and now we're coming back to that electric transportation technology. Next slide, please. So as part of our 82 bus fleet that we operate in the Anaheim Resort, we are transitioning to 100% electrification by 2025. We are very proud of our uh, partnership with BYD. We currently have six of their buses on the road. And starting next month, we begin to receive delivery of the additional 40 buses uh, that will be added to our fleet and will replace our liquefied natural gas fleet operations. Uh, as you can see, the buses will range from 30 to 60 foot in capacity and, and length. But so far, we've decided to work with BYD given on their proven successes with deployments at other areas and other transit agencies throughout Southern California. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our project involves a build out of two brand new facilities. Uh, we refer to them as Claudina and Manchester site. Uh, those facilities will incorporate, uh, Claudina site will be 100% charging facility for all 82 buses. We're building it out with the capacity to accommodate all 82 at full build out, even though the original uh, fleet deployment will be only 46. Our Manchester facility will also include some electric charging, but will primarily be our operations and maintenance facility. Land in Anaheim is a value, of course, so finding given those two sites that combine are about four acres is of uh, great success for us. And uh, we were able to structure a unique opportunity through LCFS credits with the city of Anaheim to finance purchase of the and land acquisition through this particular facilities. Both sites will include solar installation, power purchase agreements, and we're working on some microgrid solutions for phase two deployments. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have two phases that we're entering. The phase one is like uh, infrastructure and charging man charge management system uh, for 46 buses that will be in our fleet by spring of next year. We're also, as I mentioned, in the power purchase agreement with Ampli and a number of other partners that I'll cover shortly. Phase two will deal with our Manchester facility, install a microgrid, and also look at some resiliency options to ensure that both facilities are able to accommodate our fleet uh, from, from the resiliency standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. Here's our team. Uh, and as we talk about the financial structure, I just want to make sure that you understand that this was just done. Uh, we entered into the power purchase agreement with Ampli officially on August 28th. So this is brand new. But we approached it from a standpoint of public-private partnership. We value P3s and we understand that as a public sector uh, provider, we need to engage private sector ingenuity, ability and availability of capital, and also an opportunity to guide our financial future and planning perspective. So on the one side of the slide, you'll see the technical capabilities. And on the other side of this slide, you will see our technology and technical expertise that helped us guide through PPA negotiation, structuring of our uh, pr project and so forth. Next slide, please. The purpose of this team was to make sure that we do not have a Griswold effect. Um, I tried to have some fun with it, but uh, on the next slide, on the serious note, you will see, next slide please, that uh, the structure was very carefully negotiated to make sure that the ATN has the financial capacity and the opportunity to have the financial structure necessary to sustain us through initial deployment and the deployment of the entire fleet. Next slide please. So the bottom slot, the bottom chart is what's most important. We went with the approach that we wanted to have a 20 year structure, guaranteed cost and cost can only go down for our energy. It was important from a standpoint of our partners and the financial structure of our organization. As you can see, we negotiated the rates for charge management system, PPA, and we secured a 20 year rate with our Anaheim public utility. The cost of energy can go down by 8%, but can never increase above the rates that we negotiated through the PPA. Next slide, please. We worked with SAGE to, to develop a strong uh, financial uh, structure and an ability to account for all costs. Next slide, please. And I would like to spend the rest of my time right here. 
a lot of consultants will advise you to look at the actual cost of energy without the cost of CMS or PV infrastructure. And that's an important number to look at. However, we cannot have a Griswold effect. Therefore, we need to look at the total cost of energy, provision of that energy that is sustainable and resilient for the operation of public transit services. So we looked at the total cost of energy and compared to our total cost of uh, LNG fuel today in order to make a right type of an assessment if electric transportation technology is something that is valuable for us. We also decided not to use LCFS credits from trade. We kept them all in-house and we used LCFS credits to finance our land acquisition through the city of Anaheim. The remaining value of LCFS credits will go towards our uh, capital improvement program. That's the way we decided to structure it from a standpoint of financial viability and service projection and our contractual obligations to the destinations we serve. Next slide, please. Um, as we move towards uh, electrification of our entire fleet, I think it's important that this information is available at value and represents an opportunity for others to look at this P3 structure and deploy it through other opportunities. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this information to us and we look forward to future discussions. Excellent. Thank you, Diana, for that. That's a great, great part project and partnerships you've put together. Um, next, I, I'd like to welcome Young Park, Senior Project Manager with Bus Electrification with TriMet in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Young Park and I work at TriMet, leading our roadmap for clean energy bus fleet. I'll be presenting one year results and lessons learned from our first all-in pilot project, linking a small fleet of five new flyer short-range battery electric buses on one route that is dependent on an on-route fast charger supplied by ABB. Next slide, please. TriMet has the 11th largest bus fleet in the United States and has a multimodal system. We operate a fleet of light rail, commuter rail, demand responsive, and 700 buses, vast majority of which are 40 foot diesel. TriMet is committed and have released a plan to convert to a non-diesel bus fleet by 2040. The road to take and when and how to start the trip has been both challenging and rewarding. Next slide, please. TriMet has put a stake in the ground and are moving forward in transitioning to a greener future with our first pilot project on Line 62. It is powered by clean wind energy supplied by Portland General Electric. And it is a challenging suburban 26 mile round trip route with 700 feet of elevation. The route runs seven days a week with a long span of service and all five blocks operate in excess of 180 miles. Next slide, please. While primary charging is on route, all buses also plug in while domiciled at night and top off their batteries for the next day. We have found that this is critical for winter operations as all buses do not start at the fast charger. Buses are also equipped with electric heaters which deplete as much as 35% of stored energy in our coldest days. These 12 dispensers are all installed on a three foot wide center island and operate sequentially. We have found that it is critical to rotate use of the plugs if buses are equipped with more than one connector. And traffic buses have two, one on the rear curb and one on the street side to make use of the center island charging stations and variability in track storage. Next slide, please. As illustrated, buses and chargers must work reliably and robustly daily. And when it does, it is magical. Unfortunately, 100% deployment has already been achieved a handful of times. 
with a 200 kilowatt battery capacity coupled with a 450 kilowatt fast charger, a bus is able to skip a charge and continue service. And over a full day of operations and on route charge sessions, batteries get replenished to full. Anticipating and planning for trouble is critical in where and how to deploy short range buses. Next slide, please. Over one year of operations, buses have been deployed just 45% of the time. And we have exper experienced two extended periods of buses being grounded to resolve issues, once in December and again this summer. Amidst these setbacks, BEVs have connected and initiated over 12,000 on route charge events, leading to a charger mechanism where an upgrade kit was recently installed. Buses have collectively logged over 135,000 miles and consumed 260,000 kilowatt hours of energy. And fuel economy in mile months have averaged 1.8 kilowatt hours per mile, and in colder months, 2.3. And this is in par with other BEVs operating in the Pacific Northwest. Next slide, please. We have found that operating characteristics to be consistent amongst the driver pool. Range anxiety really does not play a factor in daily operations due to consistent arm out charging after each round trip. What is critical for us is the ability for the driver to dock properly and initiate a successful charge session on the first attempt. So we have developed and installed a metal tire bumper and further reinforced it with pavement markers and a robust training curriculum to make it simple. Next slide, please. During our two periods of grounded fleet, water intrusion inside the contactor and communications box were found to be the root cause. All boxes and connection points must be sealed and maintained properly. We have worked diligently with our OEMs to upgrade to the latest charge software, hardware, and communications protocols. More work is lies ahead. And technology will continue to evolve, and therefore, all systems on the bus and chargers must migrate and adapt. So don't let up. Be firm and tenacious with your OEMs. And most of all, choose carefully the bus and charging solutions that meet your needs. These public investments must reliably operate for a minimum of 12 years. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Young, and appreciate your uh, insights and um, kind of uh, bringing that story of your uh, work on that in the last uh, year and two. Um, with next, I'd like to welcome Ani Rabasandar, mechanical engineer with Santa Clara VTA. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to present VTA's findings uh, and explain more about VTA's technologies. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm Ani Perlai. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer at Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. I'm here to present an interesting aspect uh, of uh, VTA's findings, which is a statistical approach to understanding electric vehicles um, and using the data from the fleet efficiently for planning and sustainability. Next slide, please. So here we are uh, at Santa Clara County. Uh, we have about 473 buses operating since April, 2018. We have five electric vehicles, uh, each, of, each of them 440 kilowatt hour, 352 kilowatt hour usable energy. Uh, these buses are primarily being used in the Eastern part of San Jose in low income neighborhoods where the pollution is fairly high. Uh, we have been using charge point CPE 250, which is a 62 and a half kilowatt uh, DC fast charging system. Next slide, please. So some of the key performance indicators, uh, purchasing 
these electric vehicles have helped us in um, in adopting ASICs utility rate structure with which we can save a lot of cost during winter time because the, the utility price is fairly less. Uh, besides that, using charging management system, which I'm going to explain further with the data in this, this presentation has helped us in saving 30 to 40% of energy. Besides that, we, we have, uh, VTA has solar facility, which can, we, which can charge up to 21, 21 buses. Uh, above all, employing electric vehicles helps us saving two kg of hazardous emissions per liter of fuel. Next slide, please. So it's an interface of the charging management system. Uh, in short, it do, it's very efficient um, in handling uh, several buses in, and it creates a charging plan on how to, how to charge the buses, when to plug them, when to, when to unplug them. It creates, uh, it can send alerts about the system, about downtimes, um, and, and, it's, and one interesting aspect is it's integrated with uh, VTA's maintenance and uh, charging scheduling system and also the onboard telematics. Next slide, please. So here, here's an illustration of what the charging management software does. During the times when the utility rate is high, it, it charges the bus at low power, which is seen from the plot on right-hand side. And then the power goes up when the, when the, when the time changes, when the rate structure changes, and then it completes the buses. So here is an illustration of charging four buses with two charges uh, with limited availability of personal during the nighttime. Next slide, next slide please. Uh, one big impact of employing this, the system is uh, reduction in energy usage during the daytime, which is where, when the utility rate structure is at its peak. So here is a plot that indicates the energy during only the daytime, which is the peak time. Uh, one might observe uh, the, the metric used here is cost per kilowatt hour. So in spite of the total energy going up from the from year 2019 to 2020, but the peak time usage, uh, which is the highest, highest, uh, which is during the daytime, has gone down significantly by almost 50% uh, by using this system. So this this is a uh, this plot could be correlated with the data from the previous slide, which indicates uh, the buses could be charged at low power during the daytime. Next slide, please. So another in interesting aspect of my analytical approach is trying to understand how long the vehicles can go and what's the state of charge at the end of the trip so that the bus could be driven back. So VT has been training its drivers extensively uh, to make use of regenerative braking, uh, getting used to the buses. So here is a comparison of uh, data from uh, after training and before training. So before training, the plot below shows uh, how long the buses can go, what's the state of charge at the end of the trip, which is clustered around 15%, uh, which is at 160 miles, in spite of driving almost 17 miles more, which is 177 at the end of the trip, the buses can still come back with, with almost 15% state of charge, which is shown on the plot on the right-hand side. Uh, so this is, a, this is due to rigorous training that we have been providing to the, to the drivers. Next slide, please. Uh, another uh, metric that can be compared is uh, the results from the simulation data versus actual data. The, so the table on the right-hand side shows a manufacturer's prediction under different climatic conditions and different loads. And the left-hand side shows actually the data obtained from the field. It, it clearly indicates in spite of uh, the weather being cold or hot, VT has been consistent in producing better results. So the lower the kilowatt hour per mile, the better the efficiency is. So in this case, uh, we're seeing almost 30 to 30 to 35% improvement. Next slide, please. So uh, based on the data from the field, I was able to construct a mathematical model, which can give us an equation uh, in terms of different parameters into consideration, such as temperature, passenger load, uh, using which we can predict what efficiency uh, we can be up obtained. So this is helpful in planning for longer trips. And here's an example that I've given with uh, 30 passengers on board, 
almost all the time at 84 degree Fahrenheit, what the efficiency could be. Uh, this model is pretty helpful in predicting that. Next slide, please. An extension of that is what I've presented here. Uh, so I was able to simulate with limited data from the fleet, I was able to simulate and extend the results to 5,000 trips. What if it were 5,000 simulations? Uh, interestingly, I was able to come up with an equation uh, which involves several factors and it can be compared to a vehicle dynamics equation, uh, interestingly. So I was able to distribute the energy cons consumed into different factors such as rolling resistance, acceleration, aerodynamics, elevation, and auxiliaries, which helps in understanding uh, the areas of improvement in future. Next slide, please. So very important learning. So why, why what's the fuss with this data? So as, as we've seen, it's critical in, in achieving cost savings for bigger fleets. Uh, with, with data, planning could be done more easily. Uh, a statistical approach is inevitable for, for having battery electric bus models with which one can have better prediction. And, and finally, the benchmarking part, it's, it's, it's very important uh, for training for drivers to get uh, used to the buses. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Annie. Um, with uh, next up, I'd like to welcome Kevin Matthews, Managing Director with uh, National Strategies. Go ahead, Kevin. Thanks, Eric, and thanks to CTE for uh, having me on uh, the conference uh, today. Appreciate that. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about National Strategies uh, work with uh, electric school buses. National Strategies is a state and local government consulting firm that works with both for-profit and non-profit organizations, and we partnered with several people to look at the economics around all electric school buses. Next slide. We're going to talk about two projects. First was the phase one, uh, which was a proof of concept project. These are the partners that were involved in that project. Specifically, want to highlight the California Energy Commission and South Coast Air Quality Management District for the three and a half million dollars they put in toward this project. Second slide. Our second project we'll talk about is the phase two, which is more the commercialization project that came out of phase one. Uh, again, the partners involved in it, and particularly, again, want to acknowledge our funding partners of around $10 million, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, and again, South Coast Air Quality Management District. Next slide, please. Uh, why V2G? Uh, it was not so much about the uh, technology of V2G, though that was an important concept about it. This was all about total cost of ownership. Can we achieve parity uh, between fossil fuel school buses and electric school buses uh, over their life expectancy, which is generally 14 years. And so the question came about, can V2G get us there? Uh, because we felt it was important to begin to move students from fossil fuels transportation into zero emission uh, uh, transportation uh, to and from school. And our models indicated that it could provide, you know, V2G could provide $5,000 to $20,000 per bus per year. So was this the case and could it actually impact bottom line? Next slide, please. Uh, our proof one concept uh, was just uh, retrofitting uh, six school buses uh, with EV V2G systems. There you see the buses. These are parked in Torrance Unified School District uh, and the retrofit we did to them. Uh, next slide. Uh, here you actually see the proof of concept. This is a V2G signal. Uh, so the top line, the blue line, is the signal from demanding energy, and the yellow line following is the actual power provided from the school bus uh, in real time in order to meet the demand request. So we were able to demonstrate in, in, in the phase one project that you could make an electric school bus go 80 miles and deliver students, and you could do V2G to respond to a signal. Next slide. Uh, that then led to our next project, uh, the phase two, which was now can we move this to commercialization? Uh, can we deliver an all-electric V2G school bus that's purpose-built for this activity? And so our primary partner, Bluebird School Bus, which is one of the nation's largest provider of school buses and the leader in alternative fuel school buses, uh, began to work with us to develop the Vision Electric, which you see here as, as the model that will be coming out uh, that will have the V2G uh, capability uh, and, and part of this project. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so what did we learn in this? Uh, and that's the real you know, thing we want to talk about in this point, uh, at this point in time after doing these two projects. And again, the phase two project, the uh, commercialization is still ongoing, not completed. Uh, buses will be delivered next year to Rialto Unified School District in California uh, for that project, but we do have a lot of lessons learned from it already. Uh, first off, you know, early states V2G is not for the faint of heart. You've really you know, got to be committed to get this done. Uh, the good news though is hardware and software exist, it's there. Uh, the other really good news is what was missing in V2G for many years was the V. Uh, now we have the V. Uh, oh, uh, Bluebird's producing it, some other people are beginning to produce vehicles uh, that actually have it. Uh, the big positive, it's real. Uh, our phase one project did demonstrate $5,000 per bus per year uh, was actually uh, 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 an energy cost avoidance in that particular uh, dynamic. And then our phase two project uh, is estimating that we'll be at over $6,000 uh, per bus per year. And that really impacts uh, TCO uh, when you're looking at a, a school bus that can last up to, to 14 years and that payback between the initial purchase price of a school bus and all electric one over its lifetime. Uh, one thing you really have to look at though critically on this is how you're going to perform V2G and what the options are because you can do both behind the meter and in front of the meter. Uh, so in the phase one, we did behind the meter uh, activities. Uh, in phase two, we'll be going beyond actually participating in uh, Southern California Edison and CAISO energy markets responding to their signals uh, and doing that uh, type of activity. Uh, every element is really critical uh, in this type of a project. One of the big things we learned early on in this project is the charging cable weight. You know, school buses are operated by people often retired who have other issues lifting up and putting in a cable can be an issue. Uh, and so you've really got to involve all elements in this to figure out the best way to do it. Uh, we've still got some state regulatory issues to deal with. Uh, will the state allow vehicle to grid? Some are, some are not. Some are going through the process right now, but don't let that stop you because like we said, you can do behind the meter and just avoid energy cost uh, at the facility. Uh, and so don't, don't be disheartened if you're hearing from your state or your utility uh, we don't do vehicle to grid or we don't allow it. Uh, there are ways you can still participate uh, to, to get to where you need to be. Uh, and finally, you know, one of the things that's really going on, which is slowing the process, is UL and SAE certifications. Uh, this is going to high power charging, high power discharging, safety is an issue. Uh, you know, UL doesn't necessarily work on vehicles, SAE only works on vehicles. Getting those two professional organizations to talk to one another and say, this is how we'll do it. Uh, so safety can be met for those who ride the bus, let alone the or line people uh, up the road uh, that can potentially be harmed by the backflow of energy. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is me, happy to go into this. I know we went through it pretty quickly, uh, but if you wanna follow up down the road or in Q&A, we can do that. But uh, the reality is uh, V2G is here uh, and it can make a difference in total cost of ownership, not just with school buses, uh, but all fleet type vehicles as well. Uh, so thanks for your time. And if this were a normal conference, I'd be the last guy between you and drinks. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm glad I got done a little early. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and at this point, I'd like, I'd like to ask the panelists to, if you can resume your video and uh, can join the Q&A portion. Yes, in a normal conference, this would be when people would start grabbing their uh, roller bags and head for the airport. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Um, excellent. So, uh, like to jump into some questions. So, um, uh, first is for Diana. So, uh, you uh, have a, this uh, comprehensive plan together. You've also mentioned being in a dense urban area. Uh, can you speak if, if there's two, if there's a challenge on getting that energy delivered to your site for the amount that you need from the grid? Actually, no. We are very fortunate that we are part of the Anaheim Public Utility Territory, and we have engaged the utility from day one of planning of the service. So, no, the supply of the energy will not be an issue for us. And as we build up the facility, we're working with utility to accommodate that. We also did a full-on study with Santac that was prepared by them to make sure that we anticipated and calculated the maximum amount of energy we would need to accommodate for all 82 buses. And the facility is being built out with that capacity and the transformer will be installed to accommodate that as well. 
even if solar doesn't work, we will have does not provide as much energy as we're planning to. If there's something happens, we should be able to deliver it straight from the grid. Great. Okay. Excellent. Uh, a question for uh, for Ani. Um, on, I guess, if, if you could uh, share a little more about your, your driver training program and any kind of recommendations for success on folks looking to uh, maximize range with uh, Regen. Uh, you're on mute. I think we still can't hear you. Yeah, so uh, so we have an extremely enthusiastic trainer uh, who, who often uh, benchmark his best performance with others. Um, so he, he'll be on board every time a new driver drives an, e an electric vehicle. And besides, besides teaching them how to make use of the regenerative braking, he also teaches them what all HVAC mode they should operate on on different conditions. So... Uh, so we, we make sure we expose our drivers to different temperatures, uh, different conditions, different elevations, and how to how to make use of the training. And also, um, every day at the end of the trip, he'll monitor the data, and then and then he'll inspect like why it's high, why it's low. In case we have cases where a bus is driven by three different operators on the same day, uh, sometimes operator two might be. You know, way off so so he'll go and talk to him question him like why why he's not driving properly and sometimes he he makes sure if something continues he'll he'll be with them the same the next day so he wants to continue there still at least half of the drivers um, get get hand on how to drive these buses so it's kind of systematic we he he documents each and every training program okay thank you Excellent. Um, so I guess uh, as a couple questions are on the, the uh, V to G side for Kevin. Um, so Kevin, if I could uh, maybe summarize a couple of these. Um, w one question is uh, when uh, when do you think V to G might be as easy, for instance, as a solar connection? You know, not necessarily plug it in, but uh, kind of an understood process. Um, and then uh, if you could uh, share maybe a little more detail on how that five thousand dollars was saved. What, what, Sure. So on the on the ease of, of V2G, uh, it's going to be a little while. Uh, fortunately, one of our partners, Nuvi, I hope you saw the logo there. Uh, they have they'll do all the back end work. So uh, for for companies, uh, and there's some other companies coming along that will do that. So literally, all you'll have to do is plug in the bus, uh, and they'll handle everything else uh, that goes into that. Uh, but it's you do have to each time negotiate an interconnection agreement with the utility, just like in the solar days, old solar days, that took a while. And then it became a one day process going forward. Uh, so I figure in, in five, you know, less than five years, uh, California faster, they're moving sooner. Uh, you know, it'll be, you know, just like it is for the, the, the solar industry on, on the interconnection type agreement. On the phase one project uh, at Torrance, what we did there is that was a, a fleet of about 35 school buses that we converted, put two of the electric ones into. The remaining 33 buses were CNG school buses. They had a CNG compressor station uh, on site uh, that they used to fill up the buses at the end of each day. We connected the two electric school buses to the CNG compressor station and basically ran the compressor station using those two buses. Uh, and so that avoided $10,000 in energy costs that the Torrance School District would have had running that CNG station. Uh, and so that's how we got to the $5,000 per bus because each bus did about you know, equal work and it was about $10,000 saved in, in, the, in the first year alone. And that was all behind the meter. Excellent, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and I guess a question, this is uh, maybe a, a, a both to uh, perhaps uh, young Dan or Ani, but um, uh, questions around uh, as your agencies have looked at um, long-term use for batteries or what happens when those batteries age out of a bus. Has that, uh, have you gotten to a place where you're thinking about that in your planning and how to repurpose them or is that uh, down the road yet? Um, I can answer part of it. Um, so so we, we are currently involved in a project um, we're trying to procure uh, large batteries for 
auxiliary storage because as I mentioned in my presentation, we have capabilities to charge up to 21 buses from solar. Um, so a direct answer would be, yeah, if, if the batteries are incapable of running these vehicles, it could be, it could be used for microgrids. For climate, uh, our, our initial plans are to look at extended warranties uh, from the OEMs. Uh, but as, as the fleet grows, um, obviously repurposing and reusing those batteries are definitely in our plans. Excellent. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, and <clears throat> if I can, a, a question for uh, for Diana. You had a, a large uh, team of experts and stakeholders. If you could speak a little bit to how what the evolution of that process was and how um, how that all came together. Oh, um, started as part of the construction of our new facility that we understood that we were a bit over our head and perhaps were simplifying some of the decision making processes um, for the deployment of the electric bus fleet. So. From the get-go, we knew that we would need to go through the PPA approach and the energy delivery charge management system side. We just never had enough funding to completely build that out. So it was uh, a financing structure. But in order to determine if we're using the right um, evaluation and thinking process for the PPA, we had to hire those technical assistants in order to help us de de develop the structure for um, cost effectiveness, um, the put through of the vehicle, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, so pardon me, for the energy consumption and so forth. So that's how the team was assembled uh, to number one, help develop us the engineering drawings that we needed for the Anaheim Public Utility, using all those drawings to, to develop and foundation for the PPA. But then at the same time, in order for our board of directors to approve a 20 year deal, we needed to take a step back from a financial perspective and say, okay, we need somebody like Sage to help us develop that financial structure that is solid. I did not want any of on my team working in the financial projections. They had to be completely independent of our input and consideration. So that's kind of the, in the short, you know, 60 second deliberation, a two year deliberation process of how to assemble that team. Thank you. Thanks. Um, excellent. And uh, a question um, to, to Young, and I, I think you, you answered this, um, but uh, you mentioned uh, kind of the, the difference in range, I think you mentioned between um, kind of the warm and cold months that, you, that you've seen. Yes, I think there was a question about the, the range. Um, so with a 26 mile round trip uh, and, and a nice comfortable summer day, in theory you could make four round trips. Uh, then would you worry about uh, charging? Um, and in winter, uh, it's, it's that two round trip uh, and you better plug in or connect. Um, these buses are, are short range buses, uh, fast charge uh, battery chemistry. So, uh, so it's intended that uh, you make a round trip and, and recharge to replenish those batteries and uh, keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think an important distinction there too is with um, with on route charge vehicles, um, the range as long as you can get back. You know, young, you I think you're really kind of communicating that in the in the right way, and that is sort of missed trips. You know, how many times can you miss a charge? Because that's really what your range is in, in this vehicle. Um, and so in, in, in some sense, if you never miss a charge, your range is uh, until you have to bring the bus home for, for cleaning, so. Um, excellent, so um, Mike, I guess uh, if what, one quick, I know you, you've answered this uh, on, the, on the chat, but I think this is a, this is a really valuable distinction. So uh, it was a, a question came in um, th about the kind of the distinction between construction costs and capital, so if you could, uh, speak to that a little bit on where how your um, slides consider kind sure. of cost responsibility. Yeah, sure. The um, the capital costs that I presented really uh, represent the actual equipment, the technology that we would be deploying, and then the installation costs associated with that. 
What's not included in that is foundation work, which typically is managed by, uh, we can work that several different ways. It's typically managed by um, uh, a general contractor that's employed by the, the agency. And also trenching work, fuel island construction, all of those elements along with sort of pulling power to the, to the, uh, to the unit. So yeah, it's a good, it's a very good question. Excellent. Um, and let's see, I think, um, I guess, uh, Dan, if you like, I think we're um, probably right, uh, right about at time. Dan, if you're on. Here we go. And he appears. So thanks, thanks to the panel. Um, I, I've just got a couple slides before we wrap this up. This is our last session. So if everybody could hang on for about three more minutes, I should be able to accomplish what I'd like to accomplish here. First off, obviously, I want to thank the session and the speakers and and, uh, and Mike and Messer for sponsoring this. Uh, I'd like to overall just thank, again, all of our sponsors, and, and we post them here again, um, of the networking sessions, of the uh, presentation sessions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide, Brooke. Just a couple things. Uh, first off, we, we are putting this, this conference on for free. We want to continue uh, to be able to put, provide this content for free. Uh, right now, I know that you know, the four markets we're talking to, universities and schools and airports and transit, are down due to COVID. We're all, we're all struggling with that. But if you, if you wanted to donate, we wanted to make sure that you, uh, you had that opportunity. And I think from a bigger picture, what we'd really like to do is work with you through our membership program. Uh, that gives us a year. Um, to work together to try to meet whatever, to understand whatever goals you have and to try to help you meet those as a nonprofit that's trying to move this industry forward. So uh, if you're interested in that, um, you know, Taylor at CTE.TV is who you reach out to, but really anybody at CTE can put you in the right direction. We'd love to at least have a conversation about membership and what that opportunity would afford you. And then last, I think the one thing I wanna, want, want to close with and want everybody to pay attention to, uh, next slide, is our next conference in Denver. I, I was talking with Lauren Justice, our development director who puts this on, and she, she used the word sliver. Uh, this is just a sliver of the content that we would typically offer on an on-site conference. Um, I think we had six one-hour sessions. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at having parallel sessions that support all four markets next time, probably three to four times the content. We're also looking at having an expo with buses to display. I think it makes a big difference to not just hear from these vendors, to hear from New Flyer, to hear from Proterra, but to actually talk to them on their bus, see those models, walk around. Uh, we're going to offer much more networking time. I know our chat was a good opportunity for you to network, but we're going to offer uh, very many events and, uh, very, and, and hopefully multiple opportunities for you to network with others in the industry, with operators, with suppliers, with bus OEMs as well. And, uh, the other thing that we are offering that I want to make sure everybody's aware of is the day before the conference in Denver, we're going to do a zero emission bus 101 class. I know that some of these terms and some of the conversations can seem uh, a bit daunting if you're new to this market. Um, CT has put together and has delivered a couple times a, a one day uh, ZEB 101 class. So you can at least understand the terms, at least understand some of the basic concepts of how the vehicles work, you know, what a KW is versus a kilowatt hour what a demand charge is versus an energy charge, some of the very basics within the industry. And I think offering that uh, to potential attendees uh, can really affect how much you can get out of the conference. So thanks everybody for being here. Thanks all of our panelists and our sponsors. I hope you got a lot out of it. And we're certainly as an organization looking forward to working with each and every one of you as we move forward. Thank you.